Uh, good morning. Um, I'm Adam Frampton. I have the uh, pleasure of introducing and responding to our second panel, which will uh, examine the contemporary conditions of small-scale housing um, as it relates to small-scale as it relates to domestic living, um, and the consequence of multiplying that small scale uh, to something larger to the kind of urban. Um, the panelists will present case studies and histories from Mexico City to show how housing is designed uh, in constructing within this rapidly growing region. Um, the sequence d differs a little bit from this. The first up uh, will be Luis Carranza, a professor at Roger Williams University in Rhode Island um, and also teaching here at GSAP. Uh, Luis holds a PhD in architectural history and theory from Harvard University. His research focuses on uh, primarily modern art and architecture in Latin America with an emphasis on Mexico. Um, he's published another, a number of books um, forthcoming in 2000, uh, March 2019 will be uh, experiments in Radical Functionalism, um, focusing on the work of uh, Juan O'Gorman and others uh, by Columbia University Press. Um, and he's been actually an invaluable resource uh, to have him share his, his knowledge and his research with our um, housing um, students in the housing studio here. Uh, second will be uh, Fernanda Canales, um, who is a architect uh, who studied in Barcelona, Mexico City, and Madrid, the latter where she received her PhD from ETSAM. Uh, she founded her firm in 2002. Uh, she received the Emerging Voices Award from the Architectural League in 2018, among um, numerous other awards, uh, recognitions, and exhibitions. Um, her work has a particular focus on the kind of spaces between the public and the private or the domestic. Um, uh, and she's also stated her concern for the kind of interrelationship between um, thinking and practice. So she's also um, aside from a portfolio of very impressive uh, built works that she'll show, she's a scholar who's um, published several books on Mexican architectural history. Um, and uh, finally, uh, Jorge Ambrosi and Gabriela uh, Echegaray will um, uh, share their work, their office uh, based in Mexico City, founded in 2011. Um, Jorge uh, holds a degree from, in architecture from uh, UNAM in Mexico City, the National University. Um, Gabriela holds three degrees from the Polytechnic University of Catalonia and one from the uh, CCCP program here at GSAP. Uh, both partners have taught in Catalonia now um, here at Columbia University. Um, Gabriela is currently teaching in the housing studio. Um, their practice has uh, also been recognized in numerous exhibitions and awards, including um, the Design Vanguard in 2017 and Emerging Voices in 2015. Um, their practice works across many different uh, types um, of, of buildings, but housing has been a kind of constant subject of study. Um, and again, I think like the other panelists, um, their practice extends into territories beyond building. Um, they're currently the curators of the Mexican Pavilion um, in the Venice Biennale. So I'll give it over to um, Luis Carranza first. Um, so uh, this will be a little bit, probably the, the most different uh, presentation of the whole. Uh, event, I think, probably, because I'm just going to be focusing on some of the historical examples in, <clears throat> in Mexico City. So um, the exponential growth of Mexico City in the first half of the 20th century, uh, from about 345,000 to 3.1 million people, and the generally poor living conditions of 40% of the city, led to a vigorous and inventive searches to address the problem of housing. The three cases that I want to talk about today um, show how various experiments um, were developed and how they still influence uh, in our models to how people think about housing uh, in Mexico. They are small proposals or prototypes whose reproduction seems to, uh, seeks to address large-scale needs. Um, by solving the, pr the problem of the unit in functionalist and economic terms, the architect Juan Legarreta define how this worker housing prototype could be developed in aggregate. For his architecture degree thesis, he built this double house, which responded to the problem of housing um, by analyzing the functions, the costs, uh, the use of the house in very scientific terms. Um, he also sought to remove uh, anything that was inessential, such as ornament uh, and kind of making the house uh, uh, direct. Uh, and also uh, by using an expensive material such as reinforced concrete, which not, was not only cheap, but was actually um, kind of an aid to provide work for, um, for the working class. Um, and he also reorganized the social relations that uh, occurred within the unit. 
he eliminated, for example, privacy uh, in favor of flexibility by adding certain, by adding curtains, for example, as the dividers of the rooms uh, themselves, so that you could, in essence, have one kind of larger uh, space. Um, <clears throat> he also um, placed the, the woman of the house uh, at the center and the threshold of the house, um, giving her a central uh, position, but also one of protection and of nurturing. She's the one that, in essence, is the guardian to the house and has kind of views into the um, kind of the, the, the little backyard. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And, um, and he, of course, uh, advocated for the use of traditional furniture. So this is not furniture that kind of would um, be brought by the by the, by, the, by the working class, but it was actually kind of spec for the house, the same thing um, a Gorman, Juan Gorman uh, would do. And he, he was proposing this type of furniture so that the house didn't seem as alienating as it could be because of its, its as radically, radical new forms. Um, the 1932 100-unit communities that he designed uh, in La Vaquita or Balbuena follow these, um, these ideas and these prototypes, except he developed units for work or for retail, as you see here, with this kind of um, uh, gates that could open up for uh, production or, or selling of commodities. Um, and then he also developed the units that had this kind of double height uh, interior space, again, to kind of avoid the oppressive uh, sense of environment from these very small and tight uh, contained uh, units. Now, with its standardized unit, uh, which is repeated into a slab, and the slab that then becomes the determinant of the city, the second case that I want to address is the Silongan model, which was most effectively introduced into Mexico by the emigre architect and ex-director of the Bauhaus, Hannes Meyer. The Mexicans, and he, this is a proposal for a large uh, workers' uh, housing project uh, that, that was never uh, built, but the workers, the Mexican architects who worked with him in the Department of uh, Working Class Housing would basically transform this model of the traditional Siedlung uh, bar uh, into something uh, different, uh, kind of the, the component of a new type of um, kind of model for housing, uh, which was also composed of a slab, but it would be a very different slab. And this slab would try to account for different family types and income types, and you can begin to see this in particular in the way that the section begins to kind of work out. Um, and it also, uh, in trying to transform this model, he was, uh, they were also trying to kind of um, avoid the monotony that could be characteristic of the Siedlung uh, model, uh, not only in the domestic scale, that of the apartment, but also ultimately of the whole urban planning uh, as well. So Mario Pani, uh, in most famously in his Multifamiliares, as we know, basically took from this model plan, as it was called, a series of examples. And I just want to point out that Pani was, in fact, one of the, uh, one of the architects that work on this, uh, in this project. So um, specifically, what we see, and these are uh, various examples of the units, we see a mixture of units that in some cases actually spanned multiple floors, so, they, so the unit you enter into one space and you go up or down, which meant that there was a skip-stop elevator system, which is what we see in the Centro um, de Cupa, uh, Miguel Aleman. Um, there was also uh, different relationships that occurred between the interior of the unit to some types of exterior spaces or exterior courtyards, both that happen in plan and in section, obviously, that allowed for this porosity of the surface uh, that um, would create different types of balconies, as well as, most importantly, some gathering zones where people could, can, could meet and, 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 and be together, which is something, again, that we saw happening in the Miguel Aleman uh, housing project. Now, what these two um, previous cases lacked was an integration with the landscape and an acknowledgement of vernacular and cultural traditions. Um, architects like Juan O'Gorman, uh, who started off being a functionalist uh, in the 19, late 1920s, early 1930s, began exploring the cave, the cave house as a dwelling, the cave house as a place to explore art and muralism in particular to create this total work of art. 
So um, Gorman is most well known for his uh, the the mosaics for the National Library of the uh, the, the Library of the National University, which he um, did following this this experiment. So the cave house for Ogorman of 1949 was really a type of personal manifesto, something that seemed uh, unique and irreproducible. Now, interested in creating an architecture that, quote, was not based on forms antithetical to humans, the architect Carlos Lasso also explored the morphology of the cave. And here you see some of his kind of early study uh, drawings from the late 1940s or early 1950s, kind of thinking about the way that the cave morphology could create a new type of architectural space, which was a type of telluric architecture, an architecture that seemed to grow out of the ground, out of the place. Um, what Lasso wanted, and he, he would eventually become the, um, the Minister of Communications and Public Works, what, what Lasso wanted was an economic, efficient, and hygienic architecture. Now, this third case addresses the transformation from what I would call a quote-unquote landscape unit to what we'll see be a landscape housing. So the experiment, the early experiments of Lasso uh, ended up being this house called the Sierra Leona house, which basically uh, was characterized by an exploration of new forms. And this meant that there was a combination of caves, courtyards, which was a typical kind of uh, Latin typology, as well as a roof garden all integrated into the same uh, building. Um, he also was exploring new materials, basically some chemical additives that would uh, uh, allow the, the, the soil to um, kind of become hardened to, uh, to prevent from water infiltration, but also they would strengthen the soils. I, I'm not sure that he knew how toxic those things could possibly be. Um, and then, then, of course, he was very interested in new forms of construction. Instead of creating an additive construction, um, he started thinking about a subtractive construction, which was not only um, uh, cheaper to make, but also uh, would create uh, a, a, an economic living uh, environment because it, uh, the, the earth itself provided for its insulation. So um, the idea of the single cave house became the idea, as I said, of a landscape housing. This is something that he actually built as the uh, director of the communications and public works in this area um, uh, in, Mexico, in the outskirts of Mexico City called Belén de las Flores. Uh, it was a housing pr project of what he called civilized uh, caves. So in Belén de las Flores, what Lasso did was to create this very large community that seemed to solve or wanted to solve the problem of inhabitation in Mexico. Um, so the community was this very large uh, community on the side of the hill that could possibly become a model for you know, like different places throughout Mexico. And he has maybe about 30 different uh, prototypes in his archives that uh, he was experimenting with. And this lasso is standing right there, just to give you a sense. Um, so now this, uh, this uh, community would have the integration of traditionally designed modern furniture that was actually built by a, a subsid subsidiary of the Ministry of Education and Public Works. Uh, the units were all uh, completely different and had the most kind of um, modern of services. Um, and as I said, you know, the unit was not only kind of housing, but also had a condition of being a roof garden as well. Now, these cave houses were incredibly inexpensive. Um, they cost less than $5 a month to rent, uh, and that was uh, fully furnished. Uh, and if you wanted to buy one, they cost $800 to buy in 1953, which I think um, amounts more or less to about like $5,000 $5, um, $5, now. So um, these three cases that I wanted to kind of show today and to kind of think about uh, represent manifestos, I think, for how housing could be altered and rethought to respond to specific needs of the Mexican people, uh, the needs for housing and hygienic shelters, but also to think about their culture. How do we kind of create housing that integrates the things that uh, work, workers are comfortable with or in environments that they're comfortable with, for instance, the courtyard house, and that perhaps maybe start to kind of generate 
um, uh, traditions or rely on older traditions, um, like for example, the tradition of at some point, I suspect we lived in caves, but you know, this is the idea of, uh, of Lasso trying to create forms that were not right angled, but, um, but something more comfortable for the human beings. And so um, uh, people, traditions, and culture were all integrated <clears throat> into these ideas of uh, housing experiments for Mexico. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. My name is Fernanda Canales. Uh, I'd like to especially thank Hillary and all of you here present. Um, I will briefly present five of my most recent housing projects in Mexico that are in different ways based on um, an attempt to deal with contradictions, contradictions that are synthesized in this image, uh, the myth of housing. Uh, you shouldn't change your family. You just have to change home. Um, and contradictions dealing specifically in Mexico with the social contrasts and economic uh, various situations, but also with the contradictions underlying housing projects, the um, different desires between individual needs and collective needs, and also between desires and possibilities, uh, and the specific case in Mexico between rural and urban conditions. Um, the, Four of the first projects are uh, commissioned by the CITS, the Centro de Investigación of Infonavit, the research center, by, uh, promoted by Carlos Cedillo and uh, led also by Julia that will speak later today. The projects are, will range from very small scale to larger and from rural to urban, also from specific to more generic interventions. Uh, the first one, Eva House, a house built uh, for a family that was left with no house after the earthquakes, 2017. It's the same model that uh, Derek presented for a community in Oquilan, a two-hour drive from Mexico City, a house that has to cost uh, around 8,000 US dollars and has to be built in two months. Uh, we're just about to finish it. Um, the idea here was to provide uh, Eva a house for, with three bedrooms. She used to live, as many of the people in the same area, the whole family lived in a single room uh, house where they cooked, slept, even have different partners or children of different sexes from different parents. So the idea was first to provide individual bedrooms, the for prototype A with three bedrooms and um, double height area to uh, provide this space for also communal space for a cooking, living and dining area and with different solutions to reply the same structure, the same frame with one bedroom, working space or even a terrace or an open uh, patio. This is the solution that's being built with a water deposit just above the bathroom, very economic, um, simple solution, but also thinking of how this same prototype can be replied and multiplied, become a community, uh, built with self-built um, production. We're building the bricks, uh, earth uh, bricks, and um, we're almost finished. This second project deals with the same idea of how a very single unit can grow, a house that grows with the family needs, the first prototype A, just a single bedroom, and then the living and cooking area separate from the house in order to uh, play with the separation of the two units and uh, providing a patio or different ways to uh, grow at the rooftops. This is the ground level where you have the very basic unit and also providing two or three bedrooms for the grandmother or a different the newlywed uh, daughter or whatever different family needs and also providing working space or storage for the crops. And then uh, how you can shift the volumes and provide uh, patios because most of the families are used to cooking outside or they're also used to having the bathroom outside. So it's a different typologies, the same structure. And um, this, uh, it's also thought to be a self-built with different materials. And this third uh, project, the Casa Productiva, uh, depends on uh, the very ba basic unit, 25 square meters, and how you can provide a growing house, also changing the typology, a different 
um, solutions for one bedroom, two bedrooms, and working space. You can have a tapanco, which is a double height. And this double height solution has to do with uh, reusing rainwater and having the bathroom and the kitchen just directly below the water deposit. Uh, also thought to be built with different materials, ranging from adobe to um, block or even hay, and uh, forming a community also. Uh, this project is being built now, uh, two prototypes in Apan, it's the same project that Derek also showed. We're almost finishing the houses. Um, and this is a fourth project thought of with the same concepts of the third uh, projects before, but with the logic of redensification, taking abandoned housing and providing the same idea of houses that can grow even within a vertical solution. So you have a minimum housing with the possibility of growing, of extending um, a new room, or even uh, copying the house, mirroring the, ha the apartment building. So you can use the vertical and the services, the stairs, uh, to provide a more economic situation. And this fifth project, Portales Housing, uh, this is in an urban condition in Mexico City. It's a building for 12 apartments. Um, it's, um, they range from 50 square meters up to 70 square meters, and they all have a different possibilities of extending the dwelling to the outside, either with a patio, a small balcony, or a double height apartments in the upper floor with the terraces on top. And in this apartment, the hallways and the corridors are all open spaces. They take advantage of the climate in Mexico City. So uh, they extend to small patios, to balconies, or to terraces, providing also communal areas and um, small spaces to uh, extend the, the living areas. Uh, this project is Montalban Housing. We're about to finish it um, this spring. It's a 24 apartments and also with commercial space extending to the, out the street. It's a very long uh, volume, but it opens up with different patios, different balconies. And the idea here is to provide different typologies ranging from uh, 50 square meters through bedrooms up to um, solutions just with one bedroom or working spaces. So you have uh, the diversity. In a way, I think all of these projects connect with the same idea of providing diversity within a unitary structure. So you have uh, one bedroom, you have commerce, and you have always uh, patios or balconies to extend the dwellings. This is um, the solution. You also have the rooftops and uh, double height uh, duplex housing in the upper floors. Uh, this is the seventh project. It's an utopian proposal. Um, it deals with the problem in Mexico that we have more than five million abandoned houses. Mexico, for one part, is one of the countries with more scarcity of housing, but it is also one of the places with more abandoned housing. Um, they're mostly... Um, new housing built in the peripheries, built three or four hours away from working areas or from schools with no links to public transport, no services. So the idea of this project is to take the abandoned houses and build structures just on top of them um, to provide all of the lacking services. So um, you take the, the dwellings and build on top everything that they're missing from uh, working spaces, recreational areas, and links to public transport. In the past 30 years, the population in Mexico City has grown 40%, but the territorial expansion has been of more than 260%. So, uh, you know, we're growing just to sell more, extend more, uh, buy more, but not actually related to the needs, uh, not even to population growth. So we have this uh, abandoned, millions of abandoned houses. So this is a proposal what to do with those areas instead of just continue to grow, extend horizontally. So the idea is to provide uh, with the existing uh, structures something else. 
And uh, this last project, I think in a way it relates with Luis Carranza's idea of the more organic house or um, landscape housing. It's a single family dwelling, but the idea of the client was to invite, it's for a weekend house in two hours from Mexico City. Uh, the idea of the client was to uh, always have guests, always invite, uh, so it's a house for more than two or three families at the time, that they could have a private space but also shared common areas. So in a way, I think it relates, even though it's a, a completely different budget and size, in a way it relates to the first uh, projects in the sense of you have a single dwelling that can be multiplied and have then a communal space in the center. So you have uh, nine different volumes comprising different areas, or it's like a, either uh, large bedrooms or small houses just put together uh, around the central courtyard. And you have a house that in a way uh, deals with these different gradients between the public, semi-public, private, uh, or completely private. And they open up to different uh, views um, depending as well as the first project on uh, climate issues and on orientation. So um, you have the different volumes and how can you sum up the different private needs uh, or actually thinking about the consequences of private needs in a collective territory or in a common land. So thank you very much. Hello, thank you Hilary for organizing the symposium and Nadan for the presentation. As an architectural firm based in Mexico City, when we think about housing, we think in urban environments. We don't understand housing something to be uh, in rural areas. We are used to, to understand housing in these urban environments. And Mexico has a great heritage about housing. We have great examples of, uh, from the 20th, 20th century that were projects guided by architects and institutions in, in a kind of collaboration that works really well for, uh, for a lot of years. After that, we have some more serious pro uh, projects that were not guided by architects, but more, more by political decisions and economic uh, interests. So I don't want to talk about this in specific, but because what we want to address here is that to understand that how as a typology is one of the richest representation of the history of a cultural evolution in a city. So understanding that, uh, we want to share with you not some specific projects, more, but more the questions that we have to address or that we have to confront every time that we are trying to design a project in, a, in this kind of environment. So when we're thinking of these urban environments, the first thing that we're dealing with is the idea of substitution. Because when we are uh, arriving to a, a new housing project, what we have to, to do is what, are go what is that we are going to replace? And something awkward is that normally when we are talking about housing, what we are replacing in small scale projects like in Mexico City, is we are replacing houses. So here what, what we want to, to really focus us is to understand what is what is being lost what is that in this replacement action, it's been erased from the city, and what can, do, can we do as architects to start keeping that form disappear? Because at the end, all these projects are based in this persistence. Some of them have historical heritage. Some of them are just regular buildings that could be just like demolished. But at the end, with the thing that we are dealing is that all these houses are representations of manners of inhabiting that have been created in the city for maybe uh, quite a lot, a lot of years. And that thing is something that could not be just replaced by a new housing project. The new housing project has to address and need to have the possibility to the offer the opportunity to understand this domesticity and to multiply and to reply that and try to uh, allocate these manners of inhabiting. So when we thought about this domesticity and these manners of inhabiting that exist in the city, it can be represented in very different ways. And in the history and tradition of housing in Mexico, there are a lot of examples of these different kinds of domesticity. 
So maybe just the scale of proportion of space could, could address this idea of domesticity, but maybe some other issues like in, the, in Mexico City because of the mild weather, the relation with exterior spaces and how in, in the house we are relating with exterior, it's something that has a lot to do with the manner of living, the ways that people are used to live in their houses. And it's something that cannot be changed so easily because this way that the house is related with exterior has not just to do with the, with the relation interior exterior, it has also to do with the perception of the space because, for example, if it's a courtyard where the house is uh, uses to, to get the light, all the percep perception of the space is about this pouring of light through a patio. So it's something that it could be kept somehow, and, it, and we want to explore in this exercise of projects of the office, these ideas of uh, how people are used to live on those kind of spaces. spaces. Uh, another way that domesticity could be expressed is how did a, an apartment building or how did a house it's addressing the problem of privacy and how this privacy is the rela it's related with the city and not just talking about privacy in terms of the in, of the private space or the um, the private property but also privacy in terms of the public space a public privacy that could be taken off in public spaces that you feel privacy privacy and you feel uh, contained spaces that allow you and give you the opportunity to have spaces for silence, that, it, that it's also something about manners of inhabiting. Or maybe domesticity could, could be also a way to, uh, to understand the rituals. Rituals as simple as to be standing up in a portico watching toward the streets. And there's a lot of typologies in Mexico that has to do with this idea. So, this idea of domesticity is also a tradition, and it's something, again, that could not be just erased. It's something that had to be like preserved, or at least give the opportunity to have a continuity or a transformation during the process of time. So to work with these uh, possibilities to create different kinds of domesticity, we think that the alternative, the exploration of different typologies in architecture, it's very important for us because through them, we can find or search for different ways to give opportunity to the new housings to express these different kind of domesticity. And that exploration of typology give us the opportunity to rethink or to redefine uh, concepts as simple as how to solve an apartment building in a corner of two main streets but also it gives us the chance to maybe explore the idea of the patio house and how could it be transformed into an apartment building. Or maybe also how to reinterpret this idea of the classical tenement housing building that is very popular in some neighborhoods in Mexico City, and how could that also become a new housing building, trying to preserve this idea of the tenement housing. And also explore, for example, ideas on how could a grid could use offers different possibilities of inhabiting these specific grids with complete different kind of size of apartments, uh, configuration of apartments, but always trying to explore this idea of the grid also like a typology. And also the idea of the portico again like a typology, the house with a portico that is very common in some rural, rural, rural areas in Mexico City, and how could that portico become a building like itself, a building, building with porticos? So, apart from that, from these explorations of like, typology, the other concept or concern that we normally are uh, focusing on in the development of this project is this idea of integrity. And when we talk about integrity, we normally talk about structural simplicity and economy of means, because it's, it starts approaching to the, uh, to the topic of ethics in, in our case. Because what we, what we think is that when we are trying to build something in Mexico City, the most complicated thing, uh, Derek's already explained the things and the problem that we have with earthquakes, is that the any construction in Mexico City already have an overcost because all the effort that we need to do in structures to resist the earthquake. So normally structures had to do be simple just because of that, because the structure by itself, it's already too expensive to be affordable in houses. So 
we cannot explore and we cannot start to invent things in structural meanings because what we want to do is to maintain the, the cost of the structure the lower as possible. So what we, th what we believe in this thing of integrity is how could this structure became part of the facade and every, how did every element that you put on your building it work in a structural way. It's not a way of designing facades but it's everything working. So in this case, for example, the grid of columns, it's combined with all the shearing walls that are working and they're taking the efforts for the earthquake. So all the building, all the elements in this kind of facade is working precisely to resist earthquakes and to support the building. Or maybe also talking about integrity, understanding the void that conforms not just the patio on these patio houses, but also the void that is inside the house and how these two voids are relating. So the integrity of the building became both the interior and the exterior space, like one, uh, one complete space that just flows from inside to outside. Or maybe in this idea of the grid, the grid expressed to the city like this way also again, uh, like an integrity structure that is just what it looks like, it's a grid. And inside, the same grid is ex expressed in all the apartments, just to, to be coherent and to try to, to make uh, the less elements possible towards the streets and toward the facade. And in some different cases, maybe the corridors is the element that in this tenement housing, it's trying to create this integrity through all the project and how this corridor is expressed also in the interior space of the, of the project. Or maybe again, in this project about the porticos, also how those porticos became the building and the structure, it's everything that you see. And there's no like second elements that are not working in the structural way for the project. And maybe the last thing that we are starting to, to be concerned of, as some of our other colleagues already mentioned, is that Mexico has addressed this idea of collectivity in the last years. Because the 20 previous years, maybe there was no thinking in architecture in this kind of ways. And Infonavit is one of the institutions that have uh, created this kind of opportunities to, to rethink again the idea of collectivity. And maybe in a kind of an out, in a way to critic our own work, it's what we were presenting here has to do more with redensification of a city, creating from a house, maybe a multiple house, it's an exercise of multiplication, but, but it's not yet a problem of collectiveness. It's just about redensification. Thank you very much. Um, Presentation is really amazing, um, kind of impressive work. I, one thing that kind of um, strikes me about um, the, the many projects that have been shown um, from the kind of earliest uh, early examples of uh, kind of modern modernist experimentation, um, is this idea that I think I think Luis brought up the, in the um, Juan uh, Lagaretta's projects that the um, forsaking kind of privacy for flexibility, um, and and maybe in a way how that kind of um, in a lot of Fernando's projects this idea of the kind of um, the, the sort of uh, invention, the territory for invention is kind of um, within these kind of communal spaces, the hallways, the, sp the spaces between the threshold between the kind of the private space and the sort of city on the balconies. Um, and the, the uh, you know, growth, the kind of indeterminate growth of the kind of projects. Um, and, and I think in maybe um, less so Gabriela and Jorge in your projects, but there is also this kind of expression of um, the, you know, within these kind of frames, the sort of infill, the incremental infill of windows. I know that it's not, not growth per se, but perhaps the kind of expression of these, um, of, of this kind of informality or indeterminacy. Um, and so I, I feel like that's uh, somehow um, uh, perhaps, perhaps a kind of theme or connection, maybe not, between uh, between all these kind of projects, and um, and and I wonder um, how much of that comes from the the idea of the kind of city, the rapidly expanding kind of city and the growth of you know population, but also kind of footprints that uh, Fernanda mentions. Um, how much of that? I mean, I, I think it was really interesting that um, Jorge, you mentioned like how 
uh, in a way because structure, the, the, the area for invention can't really be within kind of structure and material. I know that, Fernanda, also a lot of your work is in concrete, basically, um, even though you showed other materials. So I'm, I'm curious like how or where, um, where you see, and so it's a kind of question maybe for, um, for, for any or all of you, um, you know, how much you see your projects as um, through the kind of lens of growth, maybe? For me, it completely, because it has to do with resources, uh, with limited resources always. Um, for example, if you have just the money to build uh, 50 square meters, you, know, you have this is 50 square meters, so if you take 25 and 25, instead of doing a house that's just this, if you do the house that's this, then you have uh, another area that is also part of your house. And this space can extend to this courtyard, and this one can do that as well. So you have a house that can measure up to 100 square meters, 120, depending. Uh, I mean, land in rural areas is really cheap. I, they don't even have to buy it, so they just occupy it. So then you can extend the house and maybe just put a, a temporary uh, covering or a rooftop or whatever, really simple, and having the possibility of extending the house through time. So uh, that's the case for rural areas, which is really different from uh, urban areas where land is really expensive. So you have the opposite. You have to grow in the same space. So that, uh, that's why I think uh, Jorge um, explained that. Very simple, you just have the, the money to spend in structure. I mean, you just have to cover an area and then everything has to be to happen inside and exploring that uh, with double heights or spaces that can occur and can change within the same frame. You know, something that I, I don't know if this is a, kind of as a theme that I, that I thought, um, this, your question kind of insights is that um, in contrast to the last, per, the last group, um, which was kind of thinking from the outside, you know, the master plan to the house, to the eventually to the unit. It seems like, I mean, at least what I was trying to make a case, and I think that in you, your presentations as well, that the concern is like, well, how do people live, and what is the relationship between the user and the house, or even the user and the furniture, or the user and their sense of space, and then you know you start to kind of create the walls and the environment. In order to kind of, and then you know, then it kind of, then it multiplies, and then you figure out what the master plan for it is, which I don't know if that's the best thing, but you know, so that there's a kind of a, an aggregate where you actually start with the, with the, with the traditions, with the use, I mean, because everything of that has to do with some kind of relationship with the outside, that seems to be kind of like at the first kind of thought. Yeah, I agree with um, with what you're saying, and I was like even linking to the previous panel when they were asking about um, whether the Territorio de Gigantes could turn into sort of like a set of rules or not. I think um, by doing these exercises, by questioning like the typology of um, housing, what we do is like we're really experimenting on how to, how from like certain, from a certain territory, from a certain culture, from a so certain um, traditions, we relate to different ways of inhabiting different ways of um, um, producing or providing ways of living. And I think um, what we were sort of like questioning at the end of the, of the presentation is how this collectivity could leave behind the idea of possession and start thinking about the, the sharing spaces and like the approach to a, um, to a wider idea of like, to a broader idea of how to, how to relate to, to public space but also to the to the conditions that a private space could um, could form or could integrate in terms of um, of community, of neighborhood, of city, of like like from the smaller scale growing into the bigger scale, and then it goes back again that the um, of the richness of the typology of housing that how from the understanding or from this experimentation of questioning how to how to live we end up like, like also constructing or experimenting in the scale of the city and the evolution of, uh, of culture and history. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that I, I really actually enjoyed the, um, the introduction of the idea of like private space and the kind of solitude of private space because it's of course so central to housing and at this moment when 
you know, we're all talking about, of course, the importance of sharing and the importance of collective space. It's, it's, it's like interesting to kind of return to that and having, you know, having visited your office and, and some of your projects earlier this fall, like I, I can say that they, in a way, they have the use of the patio or the kind of courtyard. They, they are very inward. They're also very inward and very focused and in some cases very cut off actually from the city. Um, and so that's, I think it's a, it's, it's interesting you, you bring that in. And I, then I guess I'm wondering like, you know, you both, um, your work is, um, both, both of your practices are of course not just housing, right? There's, you work in other kind of types. And how much of the, I'm, I'm curious, like um, in, the exper in, the, in the experimentation with housing, how much of it would you say is like from typologically driven versus the idea of like other other types thinking and ideas from other types coming into kind of housing? Maybe that's maybe a question also for Fernanda. Um, I think for in my case it's really based in, in housing itself. Um, um, every time when I research more and more and more on Mexican typologies from, from the last uh, hundred years, I find um, more and more examples that deal with housing in different ways, in, in incorporating workspace or uh, productive, even the, the productive notion of uh, Legorreta's example that Luis mentioned earlier with retail space. And it's the natural condition of how people live, um, especially in the case for uh, women that are usually the ones in charge of the whole family economy in Mexico. Uh, they take, they're in charge of the kids, but they also have to work. So uh, it's a natural condition. So I think the, the universe is so vast of examples that uh, historically have done that in better ways that architects uh, usually plan for that. Um, yeah, I think the, the flexibility issue is so strong that there's no, um, there's no better uh, analysis or examples than the everyday, the vernacular or the um, informal solutions. For me, those are like the, the best examples. Because um, in the case for Eva Housing, the, the first project I showed uh, after the earthquake, the program, the first time I visited and knew the, the owner, uh, Eva, she had just two kids and a certain uh, economy, whatever. And then on a future visit, uh, suddenly two older kids appeared. Uh, then on another visit, she had a car that she didn't have before. So they, the, the families are so complex. Then the sister was supposed to live with her. Then there weren't any grandparents. And suddenly a grandparent appeared. So uh, family-wise, it's so... Um, complex, mm. that flexibility is not in a couple of years. It's even in, in the process of designing and even, I mean, every day conditions change. Um, even you could say uh, regarding budgets, but also regarding the, even the neighborhood. Uh, so the views, uh, and if, I mean, you're, you're not controlling anything. So I think that um, what you mentioned that projects sometimes shut off uh, the context have to do with that, at least in my, my case. The only thing that you can control is what happens inside the same uh, frame. So that's what you have to work with. Mm. Yeah, I would say that um, also um, probably from other projects where we get influenced by is the idea of how we address the territory. And by territory, not only in terms of um, the landscape, but probably what um, Luis was presented with the last case of Carlos Lasso, and these projects that question the morphology of the cave, but also the, uh, the project is not only questioning that, it's also questioning the idea of like a rooftop, a livable, um, like, yeah, a livable rooftop, and also the relationship with the courtyard, which is, which is something that we also have um, and very embedded in our culture or tradition. So, I guess like um, how other projects end up um, influencing in housing is with the relationship towards the landscape, but, but the landscape beyond its condition of, um, of, uh, of the beauty that could provide or the contemplation of the space, but the relate of how we relate to the, 
to the morphology of the construction of different terrains or different um, territories. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's, um, I, I see that also, this kind of connection to, to big, through very small scale projects, this connection to the kind of bigger scale. I know that's, it's also something that um, Tatiana has talked about a lot in her work, this kind of relationship between landscape and, and bigger systems. And I, I think it's, it's very present. And I, I, I love that we're talking about a kind of architecture of 50 square meters, yet um, the kind of, this kind of in larger impact in the, in the sort of city. Um, should we perhaps open it up for some questions from the audience? In the future, thinking about the, the question beyond design, but also at an institutional level, like how do you uh, redefine this, the conditions within which things are built here in such a way that Adam, for instance, would have the opportunity to build as much um, as quickly and to experiment through building? Because um, in a way, I think design is, is one question and something to, to discuss and to learn from. But I think ultimately, the, the, the value um, in looking at these other contexts would be in thinking how can we reshape the kind of political and institutional circumstances within when, which we're working such that the students or the faculty here would have equal opportunities um, in the United States to execute uh, work in housing, in the, in the field of housing at the same scale as you might see in other countries. And Mexico seems to be a particularly um, salient example today, let's say. So I was, I was wondering, you know, from the experience of perhaps working in Mexico, teaching in the United States, um, or working in the United States and teaching um, here and, and with an international body of students, how we start to, to have a kind of discussion about the political and institutional conditions within which we're building in such a way that we, some of these um, very salient questions, for instance, of developing new housing paradigms or, or addressing kind of family structures and, and the, the demographics for which we're building are able to be dealt with uh, through the actual kind of material um, act of, of Building things um, here, uh, so I don't, you know, I don't know if that's that's a fair question, but if, if there's a possibility of reflecting in a way on, on how circumstances in Mexico have enabled you to build and how we might rethink um, the circumstances here in which uh, we aren't able to build in the same way. Can I can I suggest a historical answer? <laughs> Since I don't have a practice. I wish I had a practice like these guys. Um, I think that one of the things that, I mean, as it was already mentioned, uh, Article 4 of the Mexican Constitution, which is a constitution from 1917 in the, middle of the, in the middle of the Mexican Revolution, which was trying to correct this disenfranchisement of a, a huge part of the population um, that didn't have housing and they were basically, you know, living in terrible conditions and had this, you know, really bad political situation. Um, I think that this is the beginning of the kind of questioning and people like, Juan Legarreta, the first guy that I talked about. I mean, I think he was like, I mean, that was his thesis project, which he built. He was, you know, maybe 19 or 20 years old. Um, and then shortly thereafter, he started building for the state. Um, and this was because there was this, this need that was associated with the revolution, this like radical kind of opening. And I think that still, I mean, this kind of in the background, the, the Mexican revolution is, is still like this kind of oddly, um, like perhaps maybe subconscious force that people keep bringing up in political discourse um, that are, I mean, it's like people are trying to get, get away from it, but it's still this thing about like the equality of the, of the people and the need for housing. And, you know, like the Imponavit, in a sense, is kind of set up like within this, you know, with this, within this paradigm of thinking. I don't know, I think that that's, you know, one of the reasons why there's so much and there's so much opportunity just because there's this, there's this need that is, you know, um, regulated by the government and the constitution. I'm, I agree, but I would say it's a, it's a need, a worldwide need. I mean, we cannot base it on the United States or Mexico. I think, uh, I mean, even Mexico, 100 years after that constitutional, I mean, after the revolution and, and the big achievement, uh, to put it in the constitution, still 70% of houses in Mexico are built informally, are legally made, and uh, they're not provided by the government. So we're still not even close to that uh, achievement. And if you think of it worldwide, we're still, I mean, we're not being useful to society. So uh, the possibilities of doing projects are, I mean, every day uh, they're needed. Uh, obviously we have to do it with the same um, velocity and the same budget as the clients, I mean, the people need it. Uh, but actually that's, I think, our big um, 
still, the, what we still have to do as architects. I, I'm also amazed at the kind of quantity of work that you've, you've been, pr pr be able to, been able to produce, and I would encourage you, Emma, to stick around for Julia's talk from in front of Eats to actually understand the sort of we context. We have studio of, this afternoon. It's okay. <laughs> um, I but um, I mean, one thing that's actually even more amazing, I think, Fernanda, I discovered that you don't have an real like an office or employees actually, and so the kind of eight to ten projects you've literally produced, you know, kind of on your own in a very direct way on kind of construction sites, and um, I think that's even more remarkable. So maybe then to kind of turn the question, like how, you know, um, how do you structure your practices to kind of achieve this 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 type of work? New York City, and its zoning, the relationship of the Department of City Planning and, and, and people in New York City and all of the back and forth. Is there any, what is that situation in Mexico City as to what, who decides or makes the rules as to what can be built where? I think in, in Mexico there are a lot of organizations that are organizations and institutions that are responsible of that decisions of zoning. And in most of the cases, they are consulted or concealed with neighbors of each, each part of the city. Not always it's like, uh, like in the way uh, that we desire to, to be, because sometimes there's a lot of interest that are pushing things behind maybe the curtains of these institutions and it could be make uh, it could really create changes in those uh, zonings but most of the cases and in the places where community is very well organized it's very difficult now to to really go go uh, behind them so they have to approve everything that is happening in the zoning changes and maybe in Mexico City, in, in my experience, there was one specific moment that really starts changing the political um, way the city starts to doing development and also how the city was understood. And it's when a ar Mexican architect that was formerly the dean of UNAM, that was Felipe Leal, when he went the secretary of uh, urban development of the city, that really changed a lot of things because it was a, a moment that in where an architect really starts designing and taking decisions and showing the public that the architectural view of a city could really change. And maybe the further uh, governors of the city had really um, take that heritage and most of them are really close to architects when, when it's convenient for them. When you're not convenient, they just push you aside. But but somehow the city really uh, felt that need of an architect. Thank you so much for a very, very nice panel and set of projects. Um, I, I appreciate very much this panel in relationship to the one before. I think the one before there were a couple of very provocative statements. And I think in this second panel, uh, the idea of learning from uh, a a group of people, a condition emerge, and rather than teaching to, and or kind of laying out a plan for others, emerging a plan from the context. And I think we are in a moment that um, learning from, or observing and learning, uh, rather than teaching and experimenting upon, it's a, it's a really important way of thinking about housing. And uh, and I also. There are other ways in which we are moving away from what you were saying, Adam, moving away from this idea of kind of a, a, a fake idea of sharing or a kind of collectivity. And you know, people, whether it's in Israel, they're moving away from the kibbutz. In uh, southern Italy, they are moving away from sharing um, intergenerational housing. And, and so there are ways in which uh, collectivity emerges in a, from a different standpoint, uh, from a, a, a point of introspection and um, kind of thinking about certain things that are to be private and certain things that are to be shared. And those things are not necessarily 
coming from an architectural textbook or from the legacy of European architecture. They're coming from observing uh, more millenary ways in which, which they're plentiful in, in Mexico, millenary ways in which that um, country and culture over millennia has learned to live from a land, build from a land, uh, medical care from a land, and not necessarily importing those things from the outside. So my question to you is, as uh, people that are pivoting between the United States and Mexico, how do you feel about the, inter you know, the legacy of international architecture and uh, international style and you know, the models of housing that so many times come from other places? I mean, I think it's a, it's a, one of the huge paradoxes of like Mexican architecture um, that um, I think you know Juan Orman, who started off as this radical functionalist. I mean, he you know uh, Legarreta and Juan Orman were actually collectively designing houses, houses, and and Legarreta was working with historians and with poets when they were designing houses. But I think that um, there's this kind of moment of crisis that. Um, that Mexico kind of arrives at in terms of how to deal with um, like modernism and you know the cave things are really kind of a response to that uh, legacy. Although you know I think one of the things that I was thinking, you know, after hearing their presentations, is um, um, how much faith I have now in Mexican modern housing, because in a sense, um, what these young people are doing, because they're young, um, is that they're actually. Um, they're actually thinking about, uh, kind of very consciously about the way that people are living, um, but then they're also um, kind of responding to the things from modernism that didn't work. Like for example, you know, the, the, the Miguel Aleman had the nursery and the pools and things like this, and you know, the Garretas had the same thing, um, which are just really kind of like variants of Siedlungen. And, and they're kind of figuring out how to actually integrate it into the everyday mm -hmm. and just like radically kind of transforming, you know, like those relationships between housing and like these other needs that are so necessary for a living. You know, there really is a prototype. It, it, it works, you know, it, it, that's not the problem. The problem is ownership. That if, it, if they don't own the unit, they say it. It's as simple as that. If they own it, it's a key. Now, and that's why I need to know, do they own it? <coughs> In my case, there are cases where they rent them and others where they own it. I, there's not a big difference as to the results uh, and neither as to the demands because actually they change as well even if they own them. Yes, I think, I think we, we, we agree on that and maybe most in Mexico, it's very common to, to own the, the apartments. The, the business of rent is not so profitable than the, the way of selling houses. So normally, the new developments always have to do with selling apartments. So renting becomes like a secondary business, maybe not the main. Well, thank you very much to our, our panel. Thank you.